So before we get on, I want to welcome everyone to Venture Cafe. This is the culmination of our Seed Immersion Program, Seed Live. We have a lot of good content for you here today, and our panel on the future of grocery is moderated by Scott Kersner. Scott Kersner is the co-founder and CEO at Innovation Leader, a growing media and events venture for people who work on innovation and R&D in big companies. He recently authored a new book called The Innovation Economy, chronicling the stories of startups, flameouts, and inventing the future in New England. Scott is the co-founder and advisor to the Nantucket Conference on Entrepreneurship and Innovation, a weekly columnist for the Boston Globe, and one of the more sought after moderators in our, in our city. Uh, and you're about to find out why. So Scott, handing it over to you. Oh my gosh, Shaheen, that is like the best intro that I've ever gotten. And it sets the bar, like there, it set the expectations way too high. Well, um, you should have said, I'm like the, like Roger was just saying, like, we're happy to be a fast follower. Like we can be number two. You could have said I was like the second most sought after moderator in Boston. Well, that's still a pretty good bar. So I yeah. Think. Okay. Anyway, thank you for the intro. I'm really excited. Um, we have Heather Paquette with us. Uh, she's VP of Retail Innovation Center of Excellence at Retail Business Services. We have Sapide Kashani, Divisional Vice President at The Giant Company, and Danielle Van Gool, Director of E-Commerce Network and Fulfillment Strategy um, at, do you guys say ADUSA Supply Chain Services, or how do you pronounce that? ADUSA. ADUSA. All right. Um, you never know when when it's a company that's got the whole like European US um, sort of merge whose pronunciation is going to win out. Um, but anyway, I'm super. I really, I really like Adusa. I think I'm going to adopt it. Yeah, Adusa. Why not? Um, so anyway, <clears throat> I want to kind of divide this into into three sections. You know, section number one is talking a little bit about what's been happening in grocery over the course of the pandemic uh, these last eighteen months. Section two is we'll talk about the future and where we're going. And I think um, the last, the keynote session teed that up really nicely. And then section number three is I really would like to have some questions from folks who are watching this live. Um, so uh, at the very least, we'd love to have questions in that third segment, but um, questions at any point would be fantastic. So if we start by talking about grocery in 2021 and kind of maybe how it's been forced to pivot, during the pandemic, um, let's make that topic one. Um, and and before we get into that a little bit, does someone want to do um, just the like, what is Ajo Del, Del Hayes and what is retail business services? In case folks joined us in progress um, in the in the conference here, Sapita, do you want to start with that? Heather, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> is this a, a a quiz to see if I was paying attention during my boss's speech because I, <laughs> yeah. I think I think I can pull this off. So no, all mm -hmm. jokes. So uh, I'll hold Delays USA. Uh, we are the largest grocery retailing group on the East Coast. We operate 2,000 stores um, that operate under three support brands: Retail Business Services, uh, AD USA Supply Chain, and uh, Peapod Digital Labs, and five great local brands which operate up and down the Eastern seaboard. So we've got Hannaford Supermarket, Stop and Shop, The Giant Company, Giant Food, and Foodline. So uh, the three great local brands are actually physical stores that service customers. And then the three support brands are exactly that. We're the brands that help keep things moving, provide uh, centralized support and innovative solutions. And um, Peapod Digital Labs runs our, our digital strategy and our e-commerce Oper uh, operations and supply chain actually has the trucks that move the products from um, vendor to, to warehouse to stores. So that's a whole delays USA. All right. And then two other just definitional things that I feel like we should cover <laughs> retail business services and also this seed program, because I had not heard of the seed program before I got invited to be part of this uh, conference here at Venture Cafe. Would you like me to take that one as well, or? Sure. Everybody else is looking away. You're the only one <laughs> making, making eye contact with the camera. So I guess, I guess you know, you drew the short straw here. Isn't there a switch where you can turn it off? No, okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so retail business services is this uh, one of three support brands within I Hold Delays USA. That's the company I have the privilege of working for, and we are 
our purpose and our mission is to provide innovative solutions, offer expertise, and uh, provide value um, and that scale that the largest grocery retailer on the Eastern Seaboard should uh, be able to leverage. While um, we're offering all of that so that the great local brands can focus on delivering to their their uh, consumer centric strategies within their five within each of their five brands and running really su superb grocery stores. So that's what retail business services does. Uh, anyone that saw Roger's speech saw uh, he went through the 11 different functions that are part of retail business services. I won't go through all of them. Uh, but I will say uh, I lead the Retail Innovation Center of Excellence, which is one of 11 direct reports that reports up to Roger. And there's other pieces such as IT, pharmacy services, project management, uh, HR services, et cetera. So that's retail business services. And then the SEED program, I'm still actually getting to know the SEED program and very excited to be doing so and spending time with SEED today. So the SEED program started several years ago around the time that uh, it was around, coincidentally, around the time of the merger, uh, where we have Venture Cafe, which is in Cambridge, where we had um, college students that would come together and talk about innovative solutions. They would brainstorm different ideas. It was extremely informal, my understanding is, the history of the SEED program. And then through Harsh's leadership and uh, the involvement and participation of Ahold Delay's supply chain and now retail business services, it's evolved into what this spectacular program that it is today, which we consider uh, hundreds of different opportunities to work with entrepreneurs and then bring it down to a final list of five candidates that we evaluate for um, actual formal working together. All right, great. That was very comprehensive. Um, thank you. So, uh, so Peter, do you want to start with just talking a little bit about like what from the consumer's perspective and from the consumer behavior perspective, like what have been the big changes of the last 18 months when people interact with grocery? Yes, of course. And, and you know, uh, Roger touched on uh, some of those things. But from my perspective, on uh, let's call it the ground level in operation, uh, the pandemic was um, really a fierce lesson in focus and agility. Um, all of a sudden, everything changed. And a lot of things were um, things that we had aspirationally wanted to accomplish over the next three to five years. And uh, now we have to do it uh, immediately. Um, rapid growth of uh, e-commerce, you know, was one of those things. Um, it, I think that when I think about the pandemic and what it did for me and sort of my piece of the organization and my team, I was really pleasantly surprised to understand how agile we really can be uh, when we're all gathered around the shared purpose and with a sense of urgency. Um, certainly, our customers wanted an omni-channel uh, experience, you know, with a heavy emphasis on grocery delivery pickup. Um, they wanted contactless solutions for payment. And we had some of that. We just had to put it on supercharge and quickly offer more uh, options. Um, Scanned Mobile, Scanned Express, and um, things like Deli Order Ahead. Um, coupons loaded to uh, the app um, and really had it we had to consider uh, and quickly go to work and uh, extending collaborations with partners that could satisfy uh, delivery needs uh, do the last mile um, we had to uh, really get engaged in uh, becoming digitally present and focused in high interaction services like pharmacy, uh, had to do mail order, drive up immunization clinics and uh, curbside uh, pickup. Um, even, even some little things like, uh, you know, hot bars, meal solutions in the store, we had to reconsider how we could do it in a way that was acceptable to our, our customer that was coming to the store. We would make it full service instead of uh, self-service. Uh, we were dabbling in with, again, with partnerships with Salad Works, sort, you know, to uh, still offer those meal solutions, but in a more uh, sterile, um, detached, contactless way. Um, I would say those were some of the things, you know, that we saw right away. <laughs> um, 
I want to ask about, you know, it's it's funny, there's this just may be totally anomalous dynamic, but um, that just happens occasionally here in the Boston area. But, you know, it seems like a lot of my memories of the last year trying to go grocery shopping at a physical store, right, was you'd have lines outside the store because they were sort of managing how many people they would let in. This summer and this fall, the dynamic seems to be you can get into the store, but the lines are growing inside the stores because I'm guessing that they're short staffed um, on labor, possibly. Is that like an industry dynamic or something you guys are seeing um, that people clearly are returning to the brick and mortar stores who may have been, um, you know, going less frequently or ordering online last year? Um, or is that just something that's that's anomalous to my like data point of one? No, you know, you make a, you bring up a good point. I think given with the availability of all the channels now, you know, everyone got used to whoever didn't know how to order groceries online learned it during the pandemic. So, uh, you know, that segment grew pretty fast. But at the same time, I think the expectation for the customer that wanted to come to the store changed. They needed, they, you know, they wanted an experience. You know, they, Roger said it really well. We were no longer selling ingredients. We were selling solutions, you know, and um, I, the labor shortage is a real thing, not just for us, but across the industry. And um, it's really difficult to deal with. Um, we are experimenting with all kinds of things and hoping that Heather is going to bring automation faster <laughs> to uh, those less desired jobs, like uh, Roger said. So we're waiting. <laughs> cool. I want to get to this question next. So have a look at the question that's up on the screen from Barbara. Um, but Daniel, can I ask you just, you know, if you were to try to capture some of what has been going on in the grocery industry on the supply chain side of things, um, you know, are there some examples um, that you can share from the last year of things you had to work through or just dynamics that were very different in the COVID era? Yeah, certainly. I think uh, one of the things that that um, Seppi mentioned was that we, we had to really quickly increase the capacity of our e-commerce network because we, we grew uh, at, a, at a really accelerated rate. Um, and so we, we had previously made the decision as a, as a company to invest heavily in click and collect and curbside pickup uh, and we're rolling out uh, this program. But when we started doing that, we were thinking that we would do that at you know those stores that would have the the, the highest impact. And it very soon, COVID made it just a requirement for a store to have click and collect almost. And and we we really accelerated the rollout. We had to accelerate the capabilities within um, that channel um, and our other e-commerce channels as uh, we had planned to kind of start um, with, with a basic approach and then uh, improve it uh, as we as we went. And we really had to pivot and invest um, and, and grow our teams to work on on improving that because if you move a, a, a significant amount of volume to such a channel, you want to make sure that that channel is best set up for the best productivity, the best customer experience, um, uh, the best service level uh, that you can get. And so we, we, we had to pivot our internal capabilities. We had to really invest in IT development, um, in, in new approaches, looking uh, ahead at um, innovations that were popping up that would help utilize and expand capacity. So some of those things are in the sphere of, of automation, um, both in those smaller uh, processes, also in, in larger processes. Uh, Roger mentioned this, but um, we, we started experimenting with micro fulfillment centers uh, and implementing robotics in some of those uh, processes and um, are, are looking at other um, trends and themes that are popping up to, to try and learn from them, uh, to try and figure out what opportunities we have to partner with, with others who are doing innovative things in this sphere to help that capacity, to help the productivity, to do more with less labor uh, so that we can take on more of that volume in the e-commerce channel. All right, cool. Thanks for that answer. Um, since this question uh, is maybe one of the first submitted here, um, let's talk about whether COVID has changed the way the organization adopts innovation um, and maybe accelerates it. You know, I, I like to sort of say last year, a lot of companies were in fire drill mode, right? Where you just had to act, you had to innovate, you had to experiment. 
without being able to overanalyze it and have a zillion meetings about it or run a zillion focus groups about it. Um, but that that sense of urgency, like it's hard to sustain it over time. So I'm curious, you know, Heather, if you or Seppi want to tackle this this question about how do you, you know, how do you make some of these positive changes endure? It's interesting you say that. One of my favorite colleagues uses, uses an expression, how do we uh, find a self-activated crisis mode that we can use in the organization when we actually don't have a crisis at our hands? Because I think we've really impressed ourselves and the, the our customers and certainly the associates that we serve in terms of showing all the things that we just talked about where we've accelerated our e-commerce ambitions far faster than we thought we would. We've em embarked on innovation because we had to in our stores and really address the COVID needs. So I feel like it's one of two things and, and both are good. One is how do we continue the to address the needs of the pandemic because it is not over, unfortunately, and, and we will continue to see some of the unique challenges. It feels like there's a new, new unique challenge with COVID often every week, every every month versus every day, which is what it was at the beginning. But then the second would be, how do we continue to grow, evolve and uh, win in our industry almost despite COVID? And so that's, you know, we all want to get back to normal and we all want to do normal business things and have normal business meetings and find normal innovation that has nothing to do with COVID. And we're still in COVID. So it's really how do we how do we learn from what we have learned as we've embarked on this crisis and uh, move some of that into the skills that we would need to move quickly and bring innovation to life when it's just a matter of we have a really cool initiative that delivers on our customers' needs, it delivers on our associates' needs, and there's just a lot of work to do between point A to point Z. And how do we do that really quickly? And it's not a crisis, but Let's treat it like one. Let's use the same skills and talents that we need to live through a crisis. So I would say those are the types of conversations that we're having right now. I would say, Scott, um, the a little bit of a maybe a you know looking at it a different way. I think this has brought to focus uh, for the field because there are so many shiny objects to chase, right? We there there is no end to. Uh, the number of solutions and technology solutions and store of the future, and there is endless solutions. I think this uh, sort of has mandated almost a more thoughtful, uh, tailored approach because we don't have time, you know, to waste time and money on, on absolutely everything to see if it fails or, or it doesn't. And I think Heather's team is really well suited for us. You know, she's a new team and She's bringing, that's one of the things that I'm really excited about seeing in her team, how thoughtfully she is sort of monitoring the industry, uh, superimposing what's available with our unique purpose and what our customers want, you know, and what our roadblocks are so that we can find solutions for exactly what we need. And I think that'll help us with being more agile. Um, there's a great question from Will about meal kits, you know, and we obviously saw um, some of the meal kit companies go public and, you know, raise lots of venture money and get acquired. And, um, you know, I think people now wonder, like, is, you know, is meal kit really a standalone business or is it something that belongs as part of, you know, my relationship with the local grocery store? And so I guess... I wonder what are you doing today to compete in this space, and is this a space that you know we'll see more experimentation in going forward? I don't know if I should take that or if Daniel should take that. So I'm good either way. Why don't you start, and then Daniel can jump in. Okay, great. So we heard in the keynote speech around how customers are eating more at home, and uh, that some people are even have learned to cook through the pandemic because they had to. And so meal kits, as the question suggests, are absolutely a customer trend. They actually have been for quite some time. This is something coming out of my Hannaford role we were very focused on delivering and other brands are as well. So in terms of is RBS strategically investing in creating meal kits or buying companies that create meal kits, 
I can't really speak to that specifically, but I will say that that is something we're going to continue to watch the market and see what is what is the solution. We tend to look at customer problems and all of the solutions that you would evaluate to solve those customer problems. If the customer problem is I'm hungry and I have no time and I need something that's a quick meal, meal kits is likely to come to among the top three of the solution to that, but there may be others that also come in. So we're really trying to look at things in terms of what is the customer problem that needs to be solved and what are the different solutions to solving it? So I don't think meal kits will be something we stop talking about. Um, my belief is that the brands are really driving a brand centric strategy around meal kits. Uh, at this point. So I would imagine you would see one strategy with meal kits at one brand and a totally different strategy with meal kits at a different brand. That doesn't mean that that will be different. That won't be different in 10 weeks from now. So I believe they are here to stay. I believe that is something to pay attention to along with a number of other customer trends. But it's interesting, like Daniel, maybe you want to jump in, but I guess one of the dynamics that meal kits benefited from pre-pandemic was people are so busy, right? And it's like, oh, suddenly I have 45 minutes. I need to make dinner happen you know, in a way we've been less busy, right? You know, you're home at 5.01 uh, instead of at six o'clock and it opens up some time for fun in the kitchen and cooking. Uh, Daniel, do you have anything to add on that topic? Yeah, so I think Heather's absolutely right in saying it's it's very much a brand centric approach. There's a, there's a few things that you can look at, or at least in, in my um, um, field of supply chain. I think trends that we're seeing is more and more, um, production is going to be pushed upstream instead of taking place in stores. So think of central kitchens uh, or, or central facilities, and that would allow us to create a much broader assortment of freshly prepared meals at a high quality uh, in a protected environment that, that has high quality, high shelf life, et cetera. Those things are, are beneficial trends, I think, to support uh, uh, different commercial strategies uh, for things like meal kits. And then if you look at it from an online perspective, uh, as uh, you know, an e-commerce company, we have the ability to invest in uh, digital ways to have customers really easily collect individual ingredients as if they were buying a meal kit by just having someone add a recipe to their cart, right? And delivering it. So those are more kind of user interface and interaction kind of uh, things and content things, but they certainly are good alternatives to a, a, a meal kit company where you order a box that comes prepackaged. All right, Will. Well, thanks for that question. Um, I want to segue into kind of just talking about the future of grocery a little bit. And I feel like in a way I've been able to dip into like these visions of the future of grocery over time. You know, Heather, you mentioned working for Hannaford Brothers, which is um, one of the dominant chains, I guess, in Maine and sort of northern New England. Um, I remember a piece I wrote for Wired back in like 2000 or 2001. And Hannaford was already doing like amazing white glove home delivery of grocery orders um, called Home Runs um, that they really had set up as a separate division. Um, obviously, I've been to a lot of startups building robots and saying, you know, hey, the grocery store of the future, the customer doesn't even need to go into, right? The robots are going to fulfill the order and all you do is come and, you know, maybe put the bags into your car. Um, and yet, you know, like my experience this past weekend is, you know, a very 2021 experience. Like, you know, my wife trying to order, put together an order for us on Instacart, no shoppers available. I get drafted to go to the store, long lines. There's no self checkout option. I'm thinking like, hey, Amazon owns this grocery store. I should be able to use this phone to scan the stuff, you know, the like 18 items or 20 items in my, and, you know, and so, uh, you know, I guess it's just kind of a segue to like, I'd love to to hear what each of you think, you know, is kind of a future direction that we're going to see because we have seen bits and pieces of the future kind of proved out as concepts. They just don't feel, you know, widely distributed yet. I'll, I'll, I'll start us off on that future uh, conversation. Um, I will, from my perspective, two of the main um, themes in what, what future has to bring for our customers is personalization and convenience. You know, I think uh, those two bullet points, if you will, um, have lots of things under them. Personalization in terms of even marketing, you know, as Daniel said, uh, a recipe, you know, that populates ingredients, you know, that for a meal that my family will enjoy, 
and is specific to my needs for the right number of people with the right gluten free or, you know, with, with the, everything that my family needs uh, tailored to me and it will come to me. Um, I think convenience, I can name so many things that we're focused on to create that convenience uh, factor for uh, our customers. But, you know, for the customer that both wants to come to the brick and mortar store, but also the one that wants to either have the groceries be delivered or pick it up. Um, finding that balance between where to invest, how to make everything be available to everyone seamlessly and uh, in a consistent fashion in all channels, um, I think is, is the future. Heather, why don't you go, why don't you go, or Daniel, sorry, you unmuted. Why don't you go next and then we'll go to Heather. Yeah, and Scott, you mentioned robotics and, and those kind of things that happens to be a topic I'm, I'm heavily involved with in, in my daily life. And I think, I, I wouldn't say robotics is the future of grocery, um, I, but I think the future of grocery, especially when you look at e-commerce, is about being close to your customer. Um, we see the demand for same-day delivery, immediate delivery, instant delivery just growing, and, and there's there's parties uh, all over the place popping up in that field. And so immediacy is, is going to be very important, and you can only be immediate if you're close to your customer. And uh, robotics and technology in general is a good enabler of that. Um, as is creating high throughput so that you can pick an order really fast and, and get it out the door fast. So uh, we're certainly um, seeing that uh, robotics, uh, for those reasons, uh, can be really interesting technology that will drive our capabilities uh, in terms of immediacy. Uh, it will drive our capabilities in terms of uh, uh, growing our assortment because, as, as Seppi said, we, we really uh, strive to, to offer an omni-channel experience, so online and offline, having a, a broad assortment, having all of that available to our customers through any of our channels is going to be important. And so that technology is, is going to be crucial for that. Um, and we are uh, piloting a lot in that um, field. We're trying technology, we're researching uh, uh, players and, and solutions. Uh, and it's certainly something that's, um, that's gonna continue to, to, um, to grow also for the reason that Roger mentioned, which is um, uh, labor. Uh, labor scarcity is, is going to continue to be a, a growing topic. And, and um, so that adds to the, the need for a good automation solution as well. Um, certainly something that we are keeping a close eye on. Yes, I agree with uh, great comments from Seppi and Daniel. I don't have a ton to add on top of that. I would say for me, Robotics don't replace customer service. They don't replace associates. Uh, our associates are our competitive advantage. That's one of the reasons that we're extremely successful as a company. I don't envision a scenario where that will change. I think what will change with robotics, and we've heard some threads of this through different parts of the session, uh, will remove some of the bad jobs. You know, you, we all do automation of, we have a, um, much improved bathroom cleaning experience thanks to robotics and partial automation. That's one of the more difficult jobs in the stores. And so it makes a bad job, uh, something that associates actually can feel a lot of pride in and can actually be perceived as fun to some. When you think about self-checkout and you mentioned Hannaford's legacy of being ahead of the game with uh, grocery delivery, you know, there have also been a number of things. Uh, we have ScanIt, which is customers scan their phones to do checkout. That is technology that has been in and out of our company for a number of decades. And so I think about that as we're not going to need associates who can do things in the future. So slicing deli meat and to a point filling orders, sometimes even checking customers out will be less important. We're going to need associates who can solve problems, who can uh, provide great friendliness and service and, and fix things as, as they need to be fixed. So it will be a lot. It, automation and robotics will shift us from having kind of beep, beep, beep type of associates to uh, associates who are readily available for if a customer chooses to come to a store, because they certainly have a choice now. They can go online, they can do curbside. If they choose to go to a store, it's typically for a reason. And we're really going to deliver on all of the reasons why they came in that day. So I see it as a compliment to our associate engagement strategy. Um, the last thing I want to ask about, and then I really would love to get to all of these great questions that have come in already, and please submit some more. 
Um, you know, the last thing I want to ask about is, you know, sustainability in this circular economy, right? You know, and this is a CPG and grocery issue, right? Is, you know, you do a big grocery shop and you're bringing lots of cans into your house that are going to need to get recycled and plenty of plastic and wrapping and stuff that isn't recyclable. Like, what does the future look like just from that perspective of, you know, hey, people, we've trained people to bring in their own bags, at least here in the Boston area and probably some other big cities, right? And so we're not wasting um, plastic and paper bags. And yet, you know, um, I'm not seeing a huge number of hopeful signs around, you know, how do we get get rid of some of the, you know, the consumption waste um, in the industry, but maybe you guys are seeing some other more hopeful indicators. Yeah, so I'll 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 say that um, sustainability, not just the um, um, at, at the forefront of the company's uh, mind, but one of my personal passions, you know, to uh, make a difference in the world. And um, I go back to how Heather explained. Um, I like that what you said about. Uh, finding out what the problem is and then finding creative solutions around it, not really focusing on the solution and driving it forward, right? Um, I think when when it comes to sustainability, there is a lot that we can do and we are doing. Um, our company just this year started partnering with a, a um, flash food. You know, they, um, they help us sell a near date, very good fresh merchandise to folks that may or may not have been able to afford the full, full price item um, and save that item from going to landfill. You know, so far we have saved something crazy. I don't have the recent numbers, but 60,000 pounds of fresh food from going to waste. But at the same time, we have fed people, you know, help them. Uh, have a more nutritious menu for their families. And uh, that's one way, you know, to um, be sustainable. Um, the the bag, you know, you bring up a good one that's near and dear to my heart, the whole bag situation. <laughs> and uh, we we really had ambitions around that. And, and then the pandemic hit and the whole sort of uh, less touching, less sharing of the spaces really kind of set us back a little bit. But um, I speak, I know for RBS, Heather, and, and Dan, but uh, for the giant company, it's one of the things that we discuss um, at almost every meeting about how we can impact the, the earth and the world and make it better from our perspective. Whoops. I asked, let's see, Michelle has a set as a question. She's from outside of the U.S. Um, assuming that a credit or debit card is required for online grocery shopping, is there an approach remain inclusive so that those who are cash only or have a low credit score, no credit score are being served mm. in that ecosystem, which I know is a challenge that comes up for lots of e-commerce, not just grocery. That's actually a really great bring up. You know, I, I'm taking note on that. Thank you for the um, bringing up the question. I don't know that we have a good solution at this point, but um, Michelle makes a good point. Cryptocurrency is the answer to everything. I yes. think, Seppi, you should have just said crypto. Crypto. Um, <laughs> let's see. There's a question from Alex who who wants to know what competitors keep you up at night. Um, you know, either specific companies that are you know that are interesting to you, or maybe just some competitive dynamics or things you've seen others launch that you say like, oh, that's kind of interesting. You know, high potential experiment someone's doing. So I'm not going to name a name of a competitor. I will say one of the things I admire, which is unfortunate because it's relative to a competitor, is companies that can move quickly. So companies that can identify a problem, find a solution for it, and move super quickly on that in a, in a non-crisis type of way. That is something as our customers are changing, as our business is changing, and as our world is changing, it's been very interesting to watch some of those we've talked about first to market and then we'll fast follow our many of our other competitors will fast follow. That's something that it makes me want to be better. It makes me want my new organization to be better at that and kind of help figure out how do we how do we move faster when we need to and when does it make sense to 
watch and see if something is going to be a big trend or not. I, I really agree with that, Heather. I think, you know, when, when you see some disruptors come into the market with venture capital uh, and margins aren't as important as they traditionally are for retailers, right? It's just a very different approach. And, and in a way, we have to adjust to that um, to remain agile and to be fast enough to keep up with um, those kind of parties. And um, that, that is certainly a challenge for us to, to stay agile um, and, and to figure out a way to navigate that field um, because some competitors don't have the same um, uh, worry about the same uh, KPIs as we do uh, when it comes to that. So it, that, that's certainly uh, something for us to, um, to stay uh, on top of. And, and I think some of the ways that we're evolving our organization and, and, and getting the group together that Heather and I leads uh, is, is an example of that, right? And I think we, we have to continue to shift our thinking in that field. Um, one future question that I would love to ask, and Daniel, maybe you've given this some thought, um, you know, it's just about as, as, ever, as the expectation for delivery increases, you know, I've often wanted to do the census of, you know, if I stood, sat on my front porch all day, how many different delivery vans would I see, you know, not just UPS and FedEx and the Postal Service, but Peapod and Amazon and everybody else that's coming down the street. And have you seen any experiments or anything interesting happening around, you know, why wouldn't a, a, an individual company, you know, not, not taking Peapod as an example, but why wouldn't a company say, hey, can we have other orders on that you know, riding on that truck, if they're coming down Scott Street, you know, anyway, you know, rather than just duplicating the, you know, duplicating the mileage driven um, for everybody's delivery van to come down my street, just kind of efficiencies on that last mile stuff. What is anything going on? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's it's one of those dilemmas in in the whole sustainability uh, piece that is so challenging, right? Because Working together would create so much benefit in, in that respect, uh, yet that's typically just not how the market works, right? And so I think most of what you see is, is really going the other direction because the more uh, volume individual uh, um, companies create, the more efficient it becomes to, to be completely self-sufficient instead of relying on, on a third party to, to do uh, uh, their delivery or their last mile. So unfortunately, a, a lot of the market is kind of moving in the in the opposite direction. Um, I, I think there's interesting things that we can think about is, is can you white label our service, our platform, our e-commerce platforms, and, and can you offer that to other smaller retailers and, and work together that way and then even combine those deliveries. But, you know, there's also just branding issues because you want to be distinctive in that in that market and you want to be distinctive for your customers you want to be recognizable preferably wear uh, a giant uh, uh, name badge as a driver that delivers right so, so um, those those things are challenging and it's it's very difficult to um, to kind of break through um, what the market is is typically trending towards do you pay attention at all any maybe Daniel or others uh, to drone delivery and what's been going on I think you know, early in the pandemic, there was some like increased focus on drones, right? Because it's like, hey, we can get, um, you know, whatever COVID tests to people more quickly or get the medication without uh, someone who's immune compromised having to come into the drugstore. But I, I don't know, I just feel like there's still so much skepticism, particularly in big cities, right? That we're going to, in addition to having hundreds of delivery trucks roaming around, we're then going to have hundreds of drones flying overhead all day. Yeah, it's it's a topic that we keep an eye on because it, it, stuff happens. But we we and I'll, I'll echo Roger again here is we we don't necessarily want to lead uh, in that perspective. Uh, and 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 maybe we will be a fast follower if, if that really takes off. I, I see a lot more application for you know a general merchandise kind of approach for for drones maybe than for um, you know three or four big totes of of groceries to be dropped off uh, on your. Uh, front door. Another trend you do see that is maybe somewhat similar is, is autonomous vehicles. And, and that too is something that we're keeping an eye on. Um, I don't know if that's something that, you know, customers will really want to have as their, as their experience. Um, but that might be something that we 
we we try and figure out what what customer response is to um, an approach like that, um, and that that could be the kind of the on the road version of a drone delivery. And I do think maybe uh, uh, a bit in light of your previous question, electric vehicles is something we are really investing in from a sustainability uh, perspective as well. We're, we're trying uh, different things. We're looking at different technology and trying to learn as much as we can in that um, space because that, that does uh, create a positive impact in terms of sustainability uh, when we uh, increase our delivery footprint. Yeah, are there, I mean, I guess maybe one last question that um uh you know i would love to ask and then happy to take any additional questions that are that are out there from the audience is like if we think about the way um you know the way uh grocery stores have been built traditionally right they're fairly large footprint lots of parking um it does seem like there's increased interest in the micro format you know kind of like a slightly you guys have a term for it i'm sure but the slightly larger than a convenience store urban uh, market kind of thing. Um, where do you see things going just in terms of like how many grocery stores they're going to be in a given city or suburban area? Um, what the formats are that are going to win out? I mean, I think it's been like a hundred years, right? Since the idea of the self-serve supermarket was invented mm -hmm. by Pinkley Wiggly. Am I getting my history correct? Right. Wasn't that the the original innovator in the like 19 teens or yeah. 1920s? Well, I'll, I'll talk quickly about, um, and I'm not sure if this is the answer to your question, but uh, at the giant company, we've definitely experimented with a uh, metro compact. Um, it's our one of our brands is called the Giant Heirloom Market that is uh, present in the Philadelphia area. And um, it's doing really well. It's really satisfying the customer needs that, you know, that person that stops by every day and doesn't do a weekly shopping, you know, to pick up fresh products, whether it's for ingredients to make that meal for that day or pick up the prepared food. Um, but um, there are people that are saying that trends of the future are coming out of the suburbia and into the city. So uh, I'm thinking that, that that trend will continue to grow with smaller um, smaller stores um, like the Giant Heirloom Market. I would say my experience at Hannaford is very similar to what Seppi just described at the Giant Company. So there is a 20,000 square foot small format uh, prototype that it started with one store and then has evolved and changed with other stores. That brand also operates a 20 eight, I believe, store cluster called the Market Stores, which have a, a bit of a different approach to delivering Hannaford strategy. It focuses on convenience, efficiency, and flawlessly executing the basics. Uh, what's not called out with that is, um, because it's not a great coin phrase, is trade-offs. So if you want peanut butter, you can have four different versions to choose from the main brands and the private brand. You may not have six different versions of each of those four. So really helping uh, those customer choices. And I would say as I moved from a Hannaford brand role to the RBS role and had an opportunity to see heirloom, which Sethi spoke to, I think that concept of trade-offs is going to be very important and things that are important to 75,000 square foot stores customers simply won't make it into a store that's a quarter of that size. And so I think in some ways, pushing for a small format can make us better operators and it can make us better merchants and can really help us focus on the right type of services that are really gonna move us forward. So it was funny, you were searching for a catchy name and I believe we call it the small format. So um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, unless, I'm, unless uh, there is a fancier name out there that I'm not aware of. Yeah. Um, and uh, one last thing I was I was remembering in our email exchange, we talked about this idea of, you know, how you all work with startups. Obviously, the seed program is part of that. But like, you know, if you think about a technology vendor, or robotics vendor, or software vendor, um, you know, are there ways you, you've sort of innovated or developed to kind of work with those folks who are who are kind of like, newer companies and not more established CPG companies or, or tech vendors? 
I would say I can start this one and then my, my friends can jump in. But as we created the Retail Innovation Center of Excellence, which started back in October, formalized in February and then officially launched in May. So we're very new. I would say that was one of the overt goals of trying to figure out how to organize and prioritize the way that we took in data from a variety of sources, including startups and entrepreneurs. There's no shortage of really awesome people and really awesome companies that are solving really big problems. But the way that you organize and prioritize all of the options out there was something that we weren't good at as a company and something that my team's very committed to trying to learn ourselves and then teach to the organization. So Seed's going to be an important piece of that. I would say uh, the Retail Innovation Center of Excellence has four hubs, the first of which is research and discovery. So it's all of the inputs that would go on to that team, Seed and other entrepreneurs would be part of that. So really bringing in options and ideas at the very beginning. So I would consider that to be the external research piece of our research and discovery hub, very carefully married with the internal research piece, which is how do we connect in with our five brand partners, uh, people like Seppi and her peers who are running our retail businesses, how do we understand what their problems and challenges are? And then how do you figure out the uh, partnership between here's a real problem that's existing at, uh, at the retail stores, at least at three or more brands, and then who's out there trying to find a solution to that? And how do we work with people to help bring some of those ideas to life in a very formal and organized way. What I don't like about this uh, in our early, early stages of trying to do it is people want to move fast and I'm one of them. I'm not an overwhelmingly patient leader. So you want to take a great idea and you want to just put it in 10 stores and see how it does, right? And I think that getting very thoughtful and collaborative and connecting early, often, and loudly with entrepreneurs and the SEED program in the very early phases of trying to identify what our brand pain points are is going to be very valuable. And I'd love to see this program evolve to the point where we're casting problems that are very specific based on brand research, and then we're counting on the entrepreneurs through the SEED program to deliver uh, solutions that address those. So I feel like it's going to take us some time to evolve to that, but that's where I see this uh, today and in the future. Great. Um, Seppi, maybe this last question from Aaron is for you. Um, and maybe it's a quick answer because we only have three minutes left. Have you given thought to dynamic pricing for loyalty program members versus non-members? Or maybe that's something you do today. Um, again, you know, you've hit me with something that is not my expertise. Uh, Heather or Daniel, do you guys have anything to offer on that? It doesn't sound like it. I was just going to say a, a positive thing about, you know, man, once you built, develop the relationship on the mobile app, you can do all kinds of dynamic pricing and incentives, right? Starbucks telling you it's double star day. So you should drink, you know, drink, don't forget to drink some Starbucks coffee this morning. I, Aaron, I yeah. think there's a lot of potential there. Definitely. Definitely. I, I'm sure that someone in the company is considering that. <laughs> yeah, in the phone of friend world, uh, I am seeing that overseas, apparently there is a part of our organization that does this for fresh. So it's not unheard of in our, uh, and I did not know that one minute ago. So uh, <laughs> if that's true, then that then that's factually correct. I would also say, having been close to watching the loyalty program um, launch at Hannaford and, and now having proximity to the loyalty programs with the other brands, it's very important to have it as an incentive and a carrot versus a stick. And I think you get into specific pricing and it, it turns in, it feels like you're punished if you don't participate in it versus you, why wouldn't you join this program? There's all of these ancillary benefits that include really customized coupons, really, you know, your rewards rack up and then you can cash them in later. I think we've talked about things like only allowing self-checkout for loyalty members. We're not doing it. Uh, but there, there's been a number of conversations around. We have these really cool, powerful loyalty programs that are connecting with customers one-on-one. -on -one. What do we do next? And what do we do after that? And what do we do after that? And I would say as someone who has no responsibility for a loyalty program, uh, I would say we need to be very careful with those decisions because these are customers who have really trusted us with that relationship and their uh, sh all of their shopping information. And I would handle that relationship with a lot of care and think about uh, maybe we will, maybe we won't, but it would not be a quick, uh, oh yeah, everybody gets 5% off. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we are just about out of time, and I know that uh, Venture Cafe likes to stick to a really tight agenda. 
it probably gets easier when you're using a platform like Goldcast where it will just turn off all of our cameras um, promptly at 325. Um, but I want to thank Heather, Daniel, Sapide. This is really a great session. I'm going to audibly applaud because I feel like there's no applause in virtual conferences. So this is actually not an applause emoji. It's real applause. Um, and thank you, everybody, for the great questions. Uh, you helped us get to some issues that um, that uh, I wasn't anticipating and uh, kept it really interesting. So thanks to all of our audience members. Thanks to everybody who organized. Uh, thanks to our speakers. And I will turn things back over to Shaheen or whoever is behind the scenes here helping us segue to the next portion of the day.